Hi Tanya, thanks for being here today and to everyone that's watching, thank you for tuning in. Um, so to start with, I just want um, you to give us a little bit of an introduction about yourself and the kind of work that you do. Hi Tiffany, it's, uh, it's, great. Well, it's great to be here, thank you so much for inviting me and uh, to everyone at home listening. I'm Tanya Espan and uh, I'm a wildlife filmmaker, which is quite a generic term because there's very specific niches within that uh, industry, but I work as an assistant producer at Silverback Films, which is a fantastic company. And that's where I'm currently based now in Bristol. And I also work with Panasonic as an ambassador and several of the sort of brand and tech companies as well. So, but yeah, essentially, I mean, our job involves storytelling, emotional and visual storytelling. And a lot of people, I think, ask the question, you know, what, what's your kind of day-to-day -day role really? And it, it's so varied. It's a kind of, you know, jack of all trades and that you're kind of, encompassing the role of a researcher but then a more experienced a more experienced one in terms of being in the field and, and you're kind of there to fully support your producer in the field as well when shooting and you know you can you can be you know speaking to a scientist one day writing up stories setting up shoots getting permits to film as well but you're also very much heavily involved in the editorial aspect of filmmaking and technically supporting your your camera talent in the field as well which is very exciting for me because I love to shoot and uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it can be quite a technical role as well. And you're kind of doing a lot of dit and offloading um, in the field too. And yeah, I mean, you're obviously, you're just one tiny little clog in an entire system and a whole team that you're working with in production. And, you know, we, we kind of work on different projects as well from kind of landmark based uh, behavioral series or conservation based films as well. That's amazing. So your role is very all encompassing in terms of uh, what you focus on in your day to day life. Um, and I know as a filmmaker, kit can also be quite varied. But yes, um, for all those watching, could you talk us through a little bit of, you know, your main cameras that you would use on the day to day? Yes, absolutely. I mean, God, I think we all love a bit of kit. I think if we're listening to this and uh, I mean, I can talk about Codex of the Cows from Home, literally. And I mean, so I work in a landmark blue chip natural history, which is very high and cinematic, a big budget series, which kind of um, the, the gold standard you know, kit that we use for that is, is red heliums usually. So they shoot AK, you have a range of, um, of frame rates that you can use as well. And our kind of core lens is the CN20, which is a remarkable piece of technology. And it's, it's a long lens essentially, because in wildlife, we can't necessarily get that close to a <laughs> To our subjects and obviously for ethical reasons as well so you can shoot very wide from 50 mil to a thousand mil and you can really pick off your sequence you know and build up your sequence with those range of shot sizes and, and get different angles too and um i mean that's the kind of gold standard but we also use you know consumer range equipment as well like the s1h which Obviously, I am a, an ambassador for Panasonic, so I do use that as well. Um, and then in terms of legs, you know, tripods for the big high-end series, we have to have heavy legs, the Atlas 40s and the Ron for Baker legs as well, um, just so that you have enough stability to get shake at the sort of longer end of the, of the lens. Um, but yeah, I mean, the S1H is a remarkable piece of technology. It's one of the world's first mirrorless cameras when it was released at the time um, that was full frame and it's an L mount system as well and it came out only two years ago and I shot with that recently um, which I don't know I could talk to you about later but um, I mean yeah 24 megapixels full frame you know, you know dual native ISO you can shoot very low light um, it's it's remarkable a lot of people do ask me what kind of codex <laughs> Or what you know for what I, formats I shoot it, it varies it, it generally varies you know depending on what, I, what I'm filming and you know the lens coverage that I have as well so I can I can be shooting on primes uh, you know when I'm in low light situations and shooting full frame so the using the full sensor um, and that would be 5.9k 42 so your chroma I mean that's the, the beauty of it is that you have so much scope for, for pulling um, and working with a lot of color detail in post-production and obviously all digital cameras. I think this is one thing that catches people out is that they're not aware that um, dynamic range, high dynamic range has been a while, for, been around for a while in digital cameras anyway, um, in that it's just the difference between the dark and the, and the shadow, the highlights and, and your shadows um, and it's measured in stops. So this camera has 14 stops of dynamic range, which just enables you to basically capture a more sh sharper, brighter image, which um, obviously if you don't have, um, you know, uh, an HDR monitor, you, then you'd struggle to, to view it, which is why I use 
um, Atmos is Ninja V as well. So I have that in my, my backpack. That's very small, five inch monitor that you can monitor and you can apply LUTs. And obviously neighbors used to shoot raw as well. And that's the kind of gold standard again for natural history because you're capturing a lot of data, which it just gives you a lot more room in post to be able to work with those images. And um, obviously, yeah, I mean, you can, you know, offboard it and record it. My only sort of quibble about it is I wish it had longer pre-roll because for natural history, <laughs> you want more pre-roll. Um, and I also dabble in drones as well. I shoot with Inspire too and, and like the Mavic too as well, which is a remarkable piece of uh, technology as well. But yeah, so I, I love Kit. So do stop me. <laughs> No, absolutely. It's, it's great to hear that there's such a diverse range of kit that you use. I guess my immediate question for those who are sort of new to filmmaking or aspiring to get to a new level is why is there um, multiple cameras that you use, especially in filmmaking? So for photography, yes. obviously most people have one piece of kit. But why, for example, would you use a RED on something and then an S1H on another? Well, that's a superb question because exactly that. people go, why don't you just stick to one camera? It's a lot easier in post-production when you're working with R3D files or, you know, H.265 codex. It's all the same. You don't have to, you know, transcode and, you know, it's, it can be quite tedious. But the reason why is because obviously for each shoot, and that's where our roles as APs or directors in the field will be choosing particular camera talent that match that particular sequence. So if we're filming in low-light situations, we'll choose an A7S Mark III or, you know, cameras that are very well suited and adapted to that low light situations that we can best capture that animal. Um, there are cameras like the, the Helium isn't particularly well adapted for low light. So when I was on a sh hide shoot filming birds in a, you know, in a hide situation at 4 a.m. in the morning, I'd be shooting with a Gemini. And obviously that's 5K, so it's a little less resolution, but obviously it gives you a lot more, you know, the ISO can expand, extend to much higher realms. And, you know, that the reason why we pick different cameras as well is for different situations. If you want to get close up to an animal um, and get some wide shots. So um, I hid a, a GH5S in a, in a, well, actually for this recent series in a nest, um, and hid it and covered it with moss. And I triggered it remotely with a, an Atmos actually with an HDMI cable that was running. So it's kind of like a very remote extreme spring watch essentially, you know, kind of recording them. And then I'd have my long lens in my hide. So I'd trigger that and then have a long lens to capture a tighter angle. So the reason why we use different cameras is because they're better suited for a particular situation, um, either low light or frame rates as well, or high speed. We can use Phantom. The Phantom cameras are insane as well. I mean, they can shoot to a thousand frames. Um, and 2K and 4K um, at 500 frames a second. I mean, incredible. And you're, you're altering your frame rates to kind of, you know, reveal a new kind of behavior or add emphasis on a particular uh, behavior or just for, for mood and tone as well. So, yeah, I mean, it's exciting that we have, I mean, they are storytelling tools and techniques because storytelling is the absolute key to everything we do because we have to get audiences to empathize with what we're with what we're capturing it's um yeah and i mean god since uh, since i remember i remember being yeah young and having a cool pix l19 which did like three megapixels back when i was young <laughs> now we have incredible things and you know cameras on our phones you know yeah. it's insane i guess as well run and gun with a red would be um well a workout <laughs> <laughs> It's so heavy. I've tried, I've tried, we recently tried a, a custom made setup uh, with a 70 to 200 mil lens um, on a carbon fiber shoulder rig as well. I mean, the lightest I can get it is eight kilograms. I mean, because obviously you have to add, you know, your, your focus wheel and everything. And it's, it's really heavy. So as you said, you know, situations where you can't, you know, if you're shooting on your own, which for my personal projects, I am shooting on my own quite often. Whereas on these big productions, you've got at least three people to support you. Um, but yes, certainly situation, situations where you can't carry that kit is a physical restriction for anyone, regardless of gender. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess the first question I'd want to ask you in terms of your actual work and your projects is, how did you get into this field? So I know that you cover wildlife, but you also have a very big focus on conservation and climate. And I wondered sort of how did that journey start for you um, or how did the passion grow in those subjects? Yes, it's, oh, I mean, so I've, I've always, it always sounds very corny when I go, oh yes, I've always wanted to get into wildlife. Okay. Well, originally actually I was obsessed with animation when I was an eight to 10 year old child because I used to watch a lot of Disney and Studio Ghibli and I was fascinated. Again, it's all storytelling when you, when you think of it and put it in that perspective. 
And I, I love drawing and doing storyboards, but it, I was also obsessed with prehistoric history. And I thought I dabbled with the thought of becoming an archeologist after watching, you know, Jurassic Park, of course. Um, and I, I, essentially I was just fascinated by natural history and art. So when I used to watch these incredible documentaries, of course, by the great Sir David, um, but of, of course, we all know that it's not Sir David doing them as much as we adore him. He's obviously narrating. It's all the incredible teams behind the scenes. And when I watched the 10 minute making of towards the end, I saw the, well, my absolute hero in cinematography, who's Sophie Dyington and Justine Evans, who are long lens camera women. And I mean, there's so few camera women or women working the craft department and area or in, in tech in general in our industry. That I just thought, wow, you know, and that visibility of seeing someone doing that, I thought, wow, this is what I could do. So I kind of, you know, put all of my effort into studying and, and researching um, biology and the sciences so that I could get go to England, essentially, and I, I got a scholarship to study a degree in zoology. And then I did the master's in wildlife filmmaking here in Bristol, which really kind of gave me a solid grounding in, in what the industry is, is like. And we had to create our own, produce our own little short film. Um, I've always I've always been driven by conservation. And, you know, the, Spain is, a, I grew up in Spain, believe it or not. A lot of people think I'm very English, <laughs> but I, I grew up there and I left the country when I was uh, 18. And I was always, you know, bird watching because it's a fabulous migratory pathway and corridor for, for many bird species. Um, but as I'm sure you know, Tiffany, that, that the climate situation is is quite quite terrible, and I mean, you know, of the 4.5 billion years history of our planet, you know, 10,000 years ago we had we've been having it really good in terms of climate stability, and you know, it was 140 years ago that we obviously started burning lots of fossil fuels, and we kind of moved from a largely agricultural based society to very industrial and. Obviously, that's caused huge, huge issues with um, greenhouse gases and, you know, extreme weather events now, which we, we, I apologize. That's uh, my doorbell. I will carry on. Um, the joys of being live. <laughs> joy, the joys of being live. It could be a cat. It could be a postman. Um, but no, it's it's been it, obviously it's a huge we, we've been watching all been watching the news and in terms of the climate emergency and you know, the staggering statistics that we look at, we, realistically, we have less than 10 years, nine years now to cut our emissions by 2030 by half. And obviously we have all of these, um, you know, politicians who are committing and agreeing to this. And we've got COP26 um, in November in Glasgow, which is, is a you know monumental event really, because obviously if we don't cut them, then it's going to be catastrophic for, you know, we could have, I read this morning, we were going to, we might have our toddlers of, of today actually might have Arctic free summers by the end of 2035. You know, it's, you know, by the end of the century, Antarctica might be colonized, the Western Antarctica might be colonizable. And it's that 1.5 degree is hugely critical because a lot of people initially was were talking about the two degree being the, the, the sort of top limit, which we could, you know, go beyond in terms of pre-industrial levels, temperatures fluctuating um, beyond that. And, and obviously we can't because we're, we don't have we don't have time to make that transition from kind of nuclear power into to renewables. We have to act now. And it's I, I think people under the misconception that we have, you know, obviously I'm not saying we as individuals have a lot of power, um, you know, in terms of what we consume and we can make a difference with the energy that we consume and, and transport and recycling and, and, you know, being vegetarian or not. But we need systemic change or great change whether good or bad in our cultural societies have come about with massive systemic change and we need to work collectively with governments governments need to kind of provide subsidies for more environmentally friendly organizations and obviously make it easier because it's it's actually a privilege you know wealthy people yeah sure they can you know say well we'll take the train rather than fly you know here or there but it's only wealthy people and it's in the short term so you have to make it affordable for everyone to make a difference and then collectively you know we have to you know act you know as a as a species really so i think all of these marches and you know climate activism is incredible and it, it certainly gives me hope because we're in a point in our history where as a species we can you know completely change the dial and and you know make a mass difference so um sorry i'm going off on a climate change tangent but i'm really really passionate about it and it's 
it's what you know the, the reason why many of us in this industry are working you know to, to try and you know make a change and I remember when I was starting out people used to laugh at me and go as in commissioners going we're not going to commission a series about climate change or and now it's completely changed the narrative because a lot of people want to know and they care about it because they care about the future of our children and, and our families. That's incredibly impressive as well, the way that you've incorporated that into your work. Um, so obviously wildlife filmmakers are already quite a niche and then <laughs> female wildlife filmmakers are almost unheard of. And so one thing that I found really interesting about your work is that you have been able to incorporate the message about saving the planet and mm. the way that you make your work is also good for the planet. You're not you know, trampling three fields um, so that other people can't photograph them or film them. Um, you're very thoughtful in your work. And I wondered at which point, um, if not at the very beginning of your career, you yes. decided to focus more heavily on the conservation than the wildlife, albeit that the two are quite interconnected. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a really good question. I think, it, yeah, exactly. When I started out, I it was when, it was a, my first proper big international shoot in Kenya, and I went to Meru National Park, and it was um, it was for a film for Born Free, off, off the basis looking at the human wildlife conflict between lions and local people, and and it was in 2016 during the ivory burn in April. It was the largest ivory burn in history, and I. The Born Free film when it came out in the 50s was hugely inspired me as a child. I remember watching it and I saw it wasn't necessarily the story of releasing the line, but it was actually that the actress Virginia McKenna, that she was so moved um, by the, the genuine story that she wanted to you know, set up the foundation to help release, um, you know, captured or circus animals back into the wild. She really, really did inspire me and think about conservation in a whole new light. And so to film and work with them was, was extraordinary. But actually being there this sort of young fluffy haired <laughs> you know inexperienced camera person in the field and I was surrounded by journalists from all over the world and you know it was President Gemma Kenyatta was just about to light the, the you know this 50, 50 ton pile of ivory and I remember looking down the lens you get so engrossed with it but when I looked up and you could smell the burning flesh which came off the, the tusks as well it was just extraordinary it was so you get emotional thinking I get emotional thinking about it because it's just so powerful you think all of those families complete of these sentient creatures that have been destroyed just because of greed um and albeit it's it's not you know people people poverty and, and the disparity between poverty and countries is is a huge issue and, and I'm passionate about that too because you can't blame people for for doing that because people are trying to survive um but it's you know it's the the consumers of these um, you know, ivory and, and, you know, the need and the drive and demand for it, which needs to be stopped. And I remember just looking up thinking, God, yeah, this is, this is what I'm meant to be doing. And it was really, really powerful moment. Um, and obviously I, I adore filming conservation films, but equally, I think people do see the value. And that's why I work on these big landmark blue chip series, because people are interested in, um, I mean, I'm a total geek <laughs> when it comes to learning about the life histories of animals, you know, I've always been driven by the science as well, but it's all about good storytelling. So I think if people are entertained and they see these, bit, I don't work, work on these big programs to be like, oh, I worked with that. <laughs> but it reaches it reaches big audiences. And it means that even if my tiny little message can get through, even in the form of a making of, you know, talking about conservation or climate change, then it means that I can I can try and, and do my play my part and trying to trying to resolve the issues that uh, the, uh, the generation of the Anthropocene have uh, created for sure absolutely and I, I do think that your work as an individual in fact everybody's has value um, and can change a lot we we actually have a few questions coming through one of which is very oh, it's so um so uh Fiesa says hi Tanya so hi Fiesa. Oh, uh, <laughs> um and then uh f-stop digital photography have asked um quite aptly as you just mentioned Mr Attenborough um but they've asked if you were inspired by him before you began your work um, and maybe this is a good time to talk about um, about that that sort of project that you've been undertaking. Yes. <laughs> well, I know it's so exciting to finally talk about it. Um, hi, guys. It's like, yeah, I can't believe you guys are listening. It's not just my mum. God bless her. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I certainly. I mean, I've I've always been. I've not been driven just for the for the sake of oh, I want to be a wildlife filmmaker. I think 
it's always been I've just been passionate about natural history since I was very very young because I lived in in an area where I could witness it you know I I feel like I was one of those last generations where I could roam free in, in olive groves and it sounds very idyllic and I used to read and obviously I yeah I, I would bird watch a lot and and I'd watch, I remember, because we were not supposed to have satellite TV in Spain or Sky TV, but we'd, we'd, we'd get good signal and I'd be able to watch the David Attenborough documentaries. And of course, I mean, he, he is the ultimate communicator of natural history and he's inspired so many of us to get in the industry. But Sophie Donaldson really did as well, because, you know, seeing a woman, you know, who was so powerful and strong and, you know, she, I mean, she's an amazing woman. I obviously know her. <laughs> I obviously know her in the industry now and uh, you know she's so remarkably dedicated to her craft and she she genuinely cares about the environment and conserving the natural world and she helps many women as well and you know trying to get into the industry which I'm also passionate about but obviously from my capacity of you know of at my age I'm trying to do as much as I can because again that's a huge issue in terms of you know the top 10 uh, tech companies in the world you know the CEOs they're all men and technology drives the world you know from our transport to how we communicate with each other so that again is a huge thing that I'm really passionate about is, is getting women inspired and interested in technology about using it um, to tell their stories because you know that way you have a more equal and balanced view and, and um, outcome and, and effect on society as well as di diverse groups of people too. So yeah, I mean, I've always been passionate about conservation right from the beginning. Sure. Um, Antonia says hello. Say hi, Antonia. Uh, she says we are watching. It's not just your mum. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, it's really interesting. And I guess the next question I would ask you is, is probably quite a long winded question. So okay. to the um, obviously, how did you get to a point where you were able to work on those projects with Attenborough or yes. you know, have those connections with Sophie Darlington how did it begin for you? Sure I mean ultimately it, it, it came down to me being in Bristol for sure I, I mean that's I, I did everything everything study wise and I built a portfolio when I was at university I, I just constantly used all of my spare time to build a showreel go out there and shoot with a really crappy camera at the time I won't say which one you know brands forget it was in the past um, but it doesn't matter, so long as you're showing that you have a, a keen passion interest to tell stories, um, then that's what people and, and obviously producers and production managers and production coordinators are looking for, because they recommend that management actually have a huge role in, in, you know, saying to producers, oh, actually, they're, you know, they're an upcoming person or not. Um, but essentially, I, I, with my, because I speak Spanish, I got some work experience at the BBC when I was just as I was finishing my master's degree. And I got to work on the Big Cat series, which was really, really cool because I adore big cats. And obviously I was filming Lions at the time and I got uh, I got to go back to Spain and um, they were looking to film the Iberian Lynx. So I kind of got in through my my language skills, really. And obviously that the fact that I had a zoology degree and a master's in wildlife filmmaking. But I mean, you don't have to. You just have to have you know, a, a good portfolio if you want to become a camera person and work in the craft department is essential. But if you're looking to go into editorial, which encompasses researching, assistant producing and producing, which means that you have more of a creative control over um, the end product, then I'd say going kind of down the research route and studying a biology or ology would be very useful because it means that you can communicate with scientists a lot more fluidly. So then I kind of once I got into the BBC, I never, I didn't leave. I was just kind of kept working. Um, and I worked on kind of Blue Planet 2, on digital projects and things like that, and Blue Planet 2. Um, and then I left the BBC so that I could do some more shooting. And I worked on a Canadian series. And then this new project, which um, I'm working, well, have just finished over three years, which seems bonkers, at Sunback Films, and uh, called The Mating Game. <laughs> which it sounds a bit like, what, sorry, The Mating Game? Is this a dating <laughs> show like Love Island, but for animals? Um, which I don't watch, but I'm sorry if any fans, but, um, but no, it's a series that looks, it's <laughs> kind of five part landmark series that looks at the, the, the behaviors and the strategies of animals, you know, trying to court and win a mate essentially. So it's kind of a follow on from the hunt if anyone saw that. And it, it looks at, you know, these various strategies across different, animal groups and I mean god it's it's been an absolute hoot to to work on because they are extraordinary and it, it's across different habitats so jungles freshwater habitats oceans plains um and then the fifth episode actually looks at how we've interfered with that process and how 
um, you know, it's made it more difficult, more like a sort of ultimate challenge to try and breed because we've, you know, influenced or affected the way that they can breed, which of course is, you know, that was um, a great thing for me personally, because I thought, great, we can actually show how we're affecting the, the breeding and life histologies of these animals. But yeah, and that's actually coming out this Sunday, the 3rd of October, 8 p.m. <laughs> And Very David fun. Attenborough, of course, narrated it, which was a huge honor. And uh, I mean, the team were incredible. I, I, you know, they were honestly the, the best team I've ever worked with. The most sincere, brilliant, passionate, kind people and talented people that you can work with. And, you know, you have your production coordinators and your managers and your fellow researchers and assistant producers and your producers and SPs and whatnot. And of course, the camera talent we work with was incredible and um it hit actually COVID hit mid midway production yeah. which was incredibly challenging to try and um obviously get shoots out the door we had to do shoots remotely and it just I mean production is difficult anyway because you can't as in filming in the in the field it's incredibly difficult because you can't control what your animal is doing yeah. um so that was a huge challenge in itself um but you quickly found as well that for me, I mean, yeah, you see how our effect on these animals was very, you know, obvious in the field as well, which also added to the challenge. But hopefully people will really enjoy it. It's a really, really fun series and we've got some very exciting behaviours too. Yeah, it definitely sounds very sort of relatable to watch, I think. <laughs> <laughs> the struggle, right? <laughs> the struggle. Um, it's very real. Um, um, we've actually had a question come in from, um, apologies for my pronunciation of this name, um, Hashitha, um, who's asked, so obviously one of the things about wild animals that people find particularly challenging is that they're wild. And so um, in terms of filmmaking and photography, obviously the yes. unpredictability of those scenarios is quite apparent. Um, so how do you cope with that? How do you work in such unpredictable environments, especially with things like big cats, um, who I imagine at some point might not be overtly happy that you're there? <laughs> Well, again, another fantastic question, because it's, I mean, it's so unpredictable. The very nature of wildlife for making is, is incredibly unpredictable. The most controllable aspect of our jobs is in pre-production, where we're researching, contacting the scientists, we can get definitive dates or guidelines as to what, what the animal's doing, when, where, how. We get our permits in place. We get all of the, you know, paperwork in place for risk assessments. We get, we assemble our team, quite like the Avengers, the ultimate team to come and film this animal. Um, but yes, quite right. As soon as we get there, it's, it's up to the animal. You know, we have to, we spend, often spend months. Um, that's our jobs, to, you know, the AP or the researchers role to, to really study and read up on these species and learn about the animals and, and you know, potentially predict or try and predict um, alternative storylines. Because of course we might go out with the notion that we want to film this particular behavior and add this to the sequence and, and, and film that particular angle with a drone. Um, but quite often the animal might not do that and you have to be prepared for that to happen in the field and be flexible I think that's kind of what you know what we're you know there for really editorial people because people go well, why do you need a director on location necessary but it's our jobs essentially to act and think quickly in the field when we're reviewing the rushes in the evenings and go okay well this isn't working what other story angle from the research can we remember okay well actually the animal can do this this or that so you have to be very flexible um, in that regard. And um, I mean, sometimes coverage is very useful. Um, one particular shoot um, that we, you know, did, we, we had multiple camera talents shooting different angles or different hides and things like that, because yeah, it's, it's just time in the field. Time in the field is incredibly valuable, which is why most of when you're budgeting, you're trying to get, yeah, essentially weeks, five, up to five or even nine weeks in the field to try and catch a, a behavior because more time you're you know sat watching a particular observing an animal the more likely you are to get it and obviously we do use hides and we are very ethical ethical about it because you know it not only is it in our policy but as moral beings we we do that and adhere to those rules and we work very closely with the scientists as well to make sure we don't affect the behavior because in the end it's it's you know lose-lose situation if if um we affect the animal and of course you don't get natural behavior and we wouldn't want to do that anyway yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, you know, there must be difficult moments where you do maybe want to intervene, um, as we've all probably read about. But I guess that would that would bring me on to my next question for you, which is how do you not only mentally prepare for these scenarios where you know that you can't intervene regardless of the situation that's happening? But then I guess how do you recover as well um, when you 
when you do witness something, I mean, um, for those who haven't seen it, I won't do spoilers, but there's a particular war scene, for example, in, in uh, one of the shows that we've mentioned. Um, obviously, I know that you might not have shot that one, but yes, I wonder how you recover from seeing situations like that, um, especially in wildlife and conservation, where it can be quite, uh, yeah, harrowing. <laughs> it is, it is, I think, yeah, you'd have to be a very strange person not to be affected by those, what, you know, what you're witnessing. Um, that was, yeah, the incredible Sophie Lanfear who was producing and directing that, that episode for Our Planet, the Frozen episode. And she was shooting with Jamie McPherson, um, both incredible, you know, pioneers in, in our industry. And I mean, yeah, it was, yeah, it really did affect me. I think if you saw in the making of, you know, emotional tears, because it's, yeah, obviously climate change was driving that. And I've certainly seen that on personal shoots for this particular series. I, I won't go into the details of it, but um, in Namibia, uh, a certain animal that we were trying to film um, because of climate change and the incredible desiccation droughts across the, the desert habitats. Namibia had one of the worst droughts in over 75 years that when we were filming. And obviously it, these climatic shifts shifts the behave, breeding behaviors of these animals, which um, is incredibly difficult to try and predict sometimes. So it meant that we captured some behaviors more than others and we had to come back a second time actually, which we were planning to do in any case. Um, but it was, it was really harrowing when we saw, there was this remarkable privet tree forest, which of course are over 400 years old. They're in remarkable trees and they're so desert adapted, but termites, the de desiccation meant that uh, they were infected and infested far more by termites and it'd been completely destroyed. And you just think these trees have been longer, you know, than the whole crew combined, the age. And you just, it was very, very harrowing. And, you know, actually I was really, really pleased and proud because I, I shot some of the making of, and, you know, I was really keen to sort of tell that conservation or the climate, yeah. the climate change element of that. So you'll see one of our crew members talking about that, which I was really excited about. So I was like, fantastic. Um, but yeah, no, I prefer being behind the camera. But um, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's it is harrowing, and and you see other parts of the planet in in Asia with the oil palm, and you know, mangrove ecosystems being destroyed, and it is very heartbreaking. And I think to deal with that, you have to have hope that what you are doing, you are telling stories, you are trying to promote the science of these remarkable people who've dedicated their entire lives to actually you know showcasing. Um, you know the the threats that po you know pose to these animals but also how amazing they are because that's what we're trying to do is get people to connect with these animals empathetically and go wow that's amazing i had no idea you know this tiny little firefly you know would, you know i mean some of the spectacles we see are just incredible um but i i do get personally affected and i think i mean i i i always used to say oh i deal with my stress by running which i do <laughs> I do when I come back if I'm not in quarantine I might always out running um but no I think we talk about it as a team and you know hopefully through the messages and the making of and the social media content as well a lot of us are voice our opinions about yeah. conservation and yeah I mean I think Silverback and BBC they're all the whole industry now which I'm really pleased about are talking more about conservation narratives which yeah, it helps you mentally and in terms of the physical difficult you know difficulties of working in the field because Oh my God, it can be brutal. Um, I mean, I went to a tropical disease doctor not too long ago because I had a horrific infection <laughs> on my leg, which is all fine. Um, but yeah, for anyone wanting to get into this industry, it is it is tough. You know, you spend months in like really dirty conditions in tents and, you know, barely eating, you kind of lose a stone, or, you know, and, and obviously it is really physically challenging in very extreme environments, depending on where you work. And obviously it can be very tiring as well, but it's, it's so rewarding and, you know, I, I wouldn't change it for the world. I think if you have that kind of mindset um, and you're just so passionate and determined to do it, then of course you can make it. It's you, you, you put up with the, un, the uncomfort and then you forget about it. When you come back and you go, oh, that was amazing. You know, then you think, then you go back and go, oh my God, <laughs> <laughs> there are moments where you're sat in a hive for 14 hours and go, what am I doing? Like, what am I literally doing? You know? And you spend weeks away from family and friends, but no, it's, it's completely worth it. So yeah, there's different aspects to, to mentally preparing yourself or dealing with the, the very sad situation of you know, the state of our planet sometimes. Absolutely. And I, I have to say, it's an incredible feat what you've achieved with your work because it does engage oh. people and it, it's beautifully shot, but the narrative is also incredible. Um, which actually brings us on to our next question. Oh. Um, <laughs> 
So Antonia has asked, in terms of storytelling, hmm. do you think that obviously in situations like this, when it comes to climate change and regarding um, conservationism, hmm. do you think that it's important to provide hope for people in that narrative? Or do you, so obviously it's sort of that balance between truthfulness and raw honesty combined with hope to encourage people to make those changes. How do you tell those stories? Do you focus on a little bit of sort of happiness and sadness? Um, or do you like to be quite sort of raw with the story you tell? And if it ends happily, then that's great. But if it doesn't, you know, it's the truth. It's, that's the golden question. And I think it's a question that a lot of commissioners and, and senior management and producers and, and creatives talk about because it also very much depends on the genre you're working with. Eco thrillers, like Terra Marta produce incredible documentaries and short films. Um, you know, the Ivory Games was one. And in fact, I saw um, the cameraman who was there filming whilst I was there, like, freaking out. He's like, oh my God, he's got a red dragon. Um, <laughs> so geeky, but I mean, it was a remarkable documentary and it was all Varunga as well. I mean, they're very hard hitting, very raw, visceral, you know, views of what's actually going on um, in terms of the legal wildlife trade. Um, so I think there, there's certainly a market for, I say market, uh, it is, unfortunately it is, it is an entertainment industry, it's a business, so you have to be able to provide people with certain, you know, content or hit a particular audience. You know, like Tiger King, which I'm sure all of us all saw, you know, it's kind of, <laughs> it's not conservation based at all because they didn't even talk about the tigers and what happened to them after. It's all about the people and the crimes that they committed which I mean it was quite entertaining it was entertaining and that's all so I think that's the thing you have to strike a balance between you know actually having big blue chip natural history documentaries that focus on behaviors so people un understand and are educated and care about them because you can't care you don't want to protect something if you don't understand it necessarily but equally we're running out of time I mean as a you know I mean not that I'm saying we've got nine years left but we legitimately have very little time to meet our climate agreements and cut, cut our emissions by 20, 30, by 50 percent. And that's that's a very you know dramatic statistic. And we have to act now. And I think people are far more aware more than ever. And I think, again, this whole COVID situation has certainly brought that to light that if we do act cooperatively. We can make a huge difference. And it just needs our political, you know, well, electorates to actually act and make a difference. And us putting pressure on them is hugely important and yeah for sure I think you have to strike the balance because of those people if you had too much doom and gloom people would just get incredibly depressed including myself because you do think you, you do panic and there is that sense of climate panic I was talking to a, um, a psychology friend the other day and she said yeah I mean I've even heard kids who are actually anxious about even having families in the future I mean mm. and that broke my heart you know and of course we all have those fears we think do I want to have a family? Do I want to commit, you know, children to having a, a very, you know, by the end of the century could be very hostile environmental conditions on this planet. So we do have to, we can't fluff it and, and sort of rose tinted. I don't think people are under that impression that it is all like that, but at the same time, we have to be very clear. And that's where, I mean, I love making short films and actually that's something that I will work on a personal project, a more conservation based one, because um, I, I love, I mean, that's the beauty of, of kind of creating, producing your own short films is that you can talk about anything. Um, but yeah, certainly the narrative has changed in our industry, which is very, very exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, someone's actually asked a very similar question. Um, f -Stop Digital Photography has asked, do you think that the, the narrative is more important than the quality of filmmaking? Um, which I guess as a filmmaker is a difficult question. <laughs> You'd always oh, want to be good. <laughs> oh, that's the hardest question so far. Uh, well, I mean, I'd hope at Silverback Films, certainly, um, <laughs> that the standard of cinematography as well as the narrative has to be absolutely top set. Because don't forget, I mean, I adore dramas and I adore Netflix and watching, you know, The Crown, The Queen's Gambit. We're competing with the likes of these mega super budget. <laughs> dramas and series that you know we have to up our game in, in that regard because in the past it was fine to just point the camera and on a tripod and get a few shots yeah. of animals that no one had ever seen before but now we have to weave narratives into it we have to get really creative with our, our cinematography and and yeah I mean yeah it's it's a whole nother you know well I'd say era really because 
when yeah. I remember watching documentaries when I was young and certainly the quality has shot up but also it's the weaved in storytelling and the narrative is, has too and we have to because you know again it is it is television it's filmmaking it's feature films and we have to you know stand out against the uh, <laughs> the crowd yeah. of amazing content that we all produce uh, you know from drama to but at the end of the day across all genres the core of of what keeps people interested are amazing characters and good storytelling and obviously uh, incredible cinematography for all the, those who are like you know consciously yeah. aware of it going oh my god look at that anamorphic lens flare or something super nerdy or yeah. oh my god look at that grade um <laughs> but even even subconsciously people who don't look at that go wow it's really beautiful so i think it is important um and we definitely have to keep both both up um, yeah, in order to compete. <laughs> no, I'd be inclined to agree because I do think, especially with natural history and wildlife, to connect with these animals, seeing sort of those impressive shots, those beautiful shots, um, as I'm sure your upcoming uh, project <laughs> it's, it's, I think it helps people to connect to them. Yes. And, you know, we've all watched a movie where the sound's slightly off and we've gotten about five minutes in before we've given up. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, do share, do share, Tiffany. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, though, I did love The Queen's Gambit. So. <laughs> Wasn't it? The Sicilian, even just like, wow, what kind of chess move was that? Did you buy a chess set afterwards? I did not, but I was very tempted. Very tempted. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've had a couple of comments that have come in. Uh, somebody's watching from Malaysia. So, <gasps> hi, Isvan. Hello. I, oh, I was going to, I was going to say, uh, I was going to speak Bahasa, uh, Bahasa Indonesian then, but I won't because it's probably terrible. <laughs> um, and then Eddie is also tuning in from Kuala Seng Selangor. Uh, oh, wow. Oh, oh, he worked on the series. Oh, my God. So he worked with us on the really? series. He's amazing. <laughs> if you want, yeah, get in touch with him if you want to film in Malaysia. We're all bigging up Eddie. Good job, Eddie. Uh, <laughs> And then uh, Antonia said that she agrees that it's a really tricky balance to strike. Yes. Um, and obviously, as you mentioned before, it's very difficult when you're working with wild animals to get the narrative that you planned on getting. Mm. Um, so I guess my next question for you would be, obviously, as the years have gone on, you've worked on some phenomenal projects. But <laughs> which project do you think for you, not necessarily your favourite, because obviously a lot of them are quite hard-hitting topics, mm. but which project for you felt the most Sort of worthwhile or, or the one that struck you the most as a project that you felt incredibly proud to work upon? Oh it's hard isn't it? Um, I mean all of them have a special place in your heart I think and the, honestly the people that you work with make a huge difference I think for that reason probably the mating game. Um, it's been an incredible three years working with yeah just in, such passionate dedicated people and I say from, for a particular shoot Again, I can't really say what, say what, but I mean, you've seen it. You can, you can see this uh, animal in, in the trailers, but um, uh, filming in Papua New Guinea in particular, it's always been a dream of mine to, to go to such a remote location because I mean, I remember watching Zoo Quest and of course, the, you know, reading about Alfred Russell Wallace and, um, you know, the theory of evolution kind of, you know, coming from the remarkable diversity of, of birds species I think there's over 856 bird species there which is incredible and it's home to the famed birds of paradise of course and um, you know it's not a very well traveled location because I mean it is notoriously quite dangerous for women to go um, but I, I went out there and directed with uh, Mark Smith who's an absolute hero of mine he's an incredible camera person he always he always features in the making of <laughs> he's either stuck in a hide filming snow leopards and so I was very very excited and geekly nerdily excited to work with him and, and the lovely Alex to Venom as well and the three of us actually shot so we were in three different hides trying to film this remarkable bird species and uh, I mean crazy hours crazy long hours and we spent um, five and a half six weeks in the field um, in like 3,000 meters up in this mountain forest, but the local people there who helped us on the, on the teams were incredible, and you know we're still in touch now. I mean they're just absolutely brilliant. And towards the end of the shoot, actually, we all had this massive celebration. And um, I use the word tribe because although it's quite sensitive, and you know a lot of us would question is that you know correct. They're very proud to call themselves a tribe, and um, so they invited us to this massive um, th this party towards the end and we celebrated this, uh, like a sort of successful shoot and of course I don't speak um you know pidgin English but um the kind of universal language was through our dancing so all of us were kind of doing a flash mob in the village and <laughs> dancing to the birds of paradise and they kind of gave us honorary names and um 
Uh, my nickname was Upisa uh, Olagama, which means bird of paradise girl. So, <laughs> and that, that was amazing. And just meeting their families and, you know, sharing the experience with them, because of course, some of them had never seen uh, some of these birds before uh, or the animal that we were filming. Um, and, and some of them had never even seen some of the cameras or, or even people from Europe. So it was such a, it was a huge privilege to be invited into, into such a, you know, a pristine part of the world where, you know, the habitat is very much untouched and the behaviors of some of these animals have never been seen or filmed before. And I definitely say that was, I mean, it was an absolute dream come true. And, and the people again, who you work with really, really make it. And yeah, it's, it was a very special, very special trip. And I'm very grateful to Silverback for allowing me to go and work on that sequence. So you'll see it on, uh, not in three weeks time, because it, it's, it's in the jungles episode, but, um, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was an amazing experience. Yeah, it sounds absolutely phenomenal. And I can imagine, you know, getting to live the experience of those people must have been sort of a really big highlight um, in that series and in that trip, especially when they're so welcoming and they're, they're allowing you to see how their life is. Um, so I guess I have two more questions for you. Um, amazing. <laughs> so the first one, for those people who are watching who are aspiring to get into this sort of line of career, have you ever... Is there a shot that you've missed? So we talk about this a lot because people always feel like, you know, once you get to that level of professionalism and, and you're working on projects yeah. that everything is perfect. And so we always like to ask this question. Is Absolutely. there anything in your head where you're like, yeah, that's the one I, I wish I'd gotten? Um, definitely. I mean, the amount of times I've gone, oh my, I mean, yeah, because especially when you've been out of sorts, because because I work, um, I, I work as, you know, editorial person, I go out and, direct with with very experienced camera talent and then when I do have time all those opportunities for me to shoot on location I'm like okay and of course it could be two or three months and you know before I've been like sort of you know really focusing and, and using the, the CN20 um I remember sh I was shooting uh, Red Crown Cranes which was for a personal Panasonic project recently and oh my god I just could not I could not get this bloody bird flying in and focus it took me <laughs> I'm not even joking, 20 goes to get it shot. Cause I mean, I was limited. I wasn't using a CN20. I was using the 150 to 600 mil Sigma yeah. contemporary sports lens, which it's not the fastest of lenses. It's like five to 6.3. Um, and it was on the S1H and obviously my legs were super light cause I can't carry a one for Baker on my own in Japan. Um, and it was, it was really hard to like focus and then pull the barrel. It's, it was tricky, you know, using the CM20 for that reason is a lot easier. You know, you have a servo zoom and, oh, the focus is like butter. It's just so you can just track it very easily. But <laughs> I was kind of compromised in, in that situation. But yeah, I, I mean, I missed it. I was like, oh, my God. And then I got a sort of, you know, so, so kind of happy shot that I thought, well, that will work. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, of course, there are times where you, you miss a behavioral opportunity. Um, but I actually, the pressure is off of me usually um, because it's not when I'm on these big productions it's not my main role to shoot unless they said right I'm paying you to shoot you're like okay that's when I, I feel more pressure but when I'm not yeah. I actually get my best work when I'm just doing like cross shooting or, or doing second camera because I'm not paid to do that I'm being paid to direct and, and you know so I'm like oh, okay great and then it's, it's a lot more <laughs> relaxing than you see the cameraman going or camera woman going okay I need to nail the shot but I mean they're incredible they really are yeah. the people that we work with but for sure you know there's moments where you're going no um but yeah particularly birds because they're very unpredictable and also very difficult to frame <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say that they're also um quite speedy uh, <laughs> yeah. oh my God. for anybody uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I guess my other question would be so obviously you've traveled the world for some of these projects and it's taken you to some really exciting places. Is there anywhere on your list that you've not been yet that you're thinking maybe for the next project? Wow, oh, this, I mean, there's just, there are so many different places I'd love to go. I mean, the Himalayas, my friend's actually just there now filming. I've always wanted to go visit there. Um, you know, Snow Leopards is obviously on the, on the list. Um, I mean, there, there's so many. I'd love to go to Western Papua as well. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I want to do, I want my next personal project because for Panasonic, I've kind of done short story about two particular characters um, in Laos, which was which was really exciting to film because I could get very intimate portraits and shoot very wide and tight and use a gimbal for that kind of short film. And um, and then I recently went to Japan and, and did this kind of cultural, more 
um, kind of contemporary film, which looked at our relationship with the natural world through a cultural lens, um, which was incredible. I mean, Japan, I've always dreamed of, of filming in Japan and Panasonic very kindly sent me there to kind of budget it and, and wrote up a, a script and story and worked with this amazing Tai Chi artist to film this short film. And that was very, very exciting. And that took, I, I kind of was, you know, working with the post-production team during the pandemic and I just film, managed to film it um, in time before I came back from um, Japan, you know, before lockdown occurred. So that was very lucky. Um, but I think for my next Panasonic project, I'd really like to kind of get involved with a more conservation driven one, um, you know, and again, what the topic might be, well, maybe, maybe something in Papua again, I don't want to go back. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, it's tricky. And for my, I'm actually working on a new project now at Silverback, not the mating game, because I've obviously finished that. And that's being delivered uh, at breakneck speed by our incredible team. Um, who who still remain some uh, some of whom still remain on it as they're delivering but um yeah I'm working on a new project which I I, I come afraid I'm so NDA'd up to my eyeballs right now <laughs> but it's very exciting um, but I basically use any of my holiday time to, to plan personal film projects so yeah, um, yeah definitely <laughs> more conservation based ones um, so we have one last question from the audience mm. from Antonia so she's asked um, when you're filming a bird coming towards you. Mm. She says that she finds it really difficult manual focus because of the, obviously the speed and the unpredictability. Yes. She's asked what you think about autofocus and tracking or how you would get that shot if you're in that situation with, let's say, uh, you know, something rather large, like a, a bald eagle flying at you. How do you yes. cope in that scenario? Well, Antonio, it is a very, they are very difficult, to, you know, to focus and film. Um, I mean, again, it depends on the kind of lens you're using. If, um, we in wildlife film we we never really use autofocus because it's, it's almost like a taboo and it's like no can't use autofocus and also it is quite bad some of it I mean I should probably not say but I mean Canon does have <laughs> exceptional <laughs> does have exceptional autofocus points so it depends on the system you're using and if the lens is native as well it will have autofocus and that will enable you to do that but I would shoot manually and it's it's practice at the end of the day I mean even just you know practicing in you know, a city filming pigeons. Pigeons are bloody nightmares, but they're very predictable in terms of you're going to get them if you put some food down. Or seagulls, just come to Bristol. Yeah. And sit, you know, seagulls everywhere. You could probably hear them right now. Um, but yeah, practicing practicing your manual focus. And also you can use the magnifier as well to actually punch in and, and focus. But by the time the bird is moving, it's already moved. It's shifted frame. So yeah, I mean, I, I use an EVF um, a lot of the time. Um, the Zakuto graphical is amazing on some of the higher end cameras. Um, you can use monitors as well, and you can obviously use focus peaking, which will help you to keep it sharp and, and keep tracking. Because often, sometimes lenses you're focusing more close, it depends on which brand you're using, either left or right. So, just getting used to your equipment and practicing on a subject, a bird, you know, closer to home that, you, you know, before you actually do your proper shoot, that yeah. you can get kind of very familiar with with how it, you know, it operates. And um, yeah, I would, I, I would advise against autofocus, I'm afraid, sorry. And, and I'm sure you'll be able to absolutely nail it. And uh, yeah, go for it, keep, keep practicing and, and, uh, and go manual, I, that's what I'd say. <laughs> um, and on that note, could you, if there are people out there who are sort of aspiring to get into filmmaking more so, and especially now, as you mentioned, there are more women working in these environments. Um, do you have any advice, like tips and tricks for people yes. that are looking to do that? Absolutely. I mean, and please, by all means, get in touch with me after this, because I, I mean, I, I love getting back to people and trying to help them, you know, even from my, from my perspective and age and experience in, in the industry. Um, but it's, I mean, you have, I think certainly building up a portfolio of work and showing that you have an eye for storytelling, sequence building as well. So if you're filming an animal, don't just film montages of it, film like, you know, moving through a sequence um, show a range of camera techniques if you're looking to become a camera person. So the fact that you can shoot long lens or gimbal or do drone, you don't have to do all of these things because a lot of people do specialize in one particular craft technique, as it were. They can do macro work. Macro is a, a fantastic, um, you know, specific camera talent that, you know, is it, amazing because you can reveal so much new behavior through it often. So I'd say definitely build up a portfolio. Um, networking is hugely important. I know people are terrified of it, but just think of it as talking to people who are really interesting. I mean, I remember when I started out, I was talking, to, I just kept yabbering to people going, I love your work. I love how you shot this. And people really appreciate it. If you spend the time 
to actually watch the rever- their work and you know review it and ask questions people will, will give you the time of day because they are they're very passionate and we all started out somewhere and um so certainly network you know there's lots of amazing websites like the you know wild screen they have they have coffee mornings or meetings and they have you know um webinars as well of course such as these and it, you know there's such fantastic um, ways to learn new techniques or just about connecting with different people that you know you because it doesn't have to be natural history of course it could be any top, uh, topic of conversation or area that you're interested in so certainly connect with people who you know likewise you you have similar interests with and they're sure to help you out um and then of course uh, you know absolute key is, is is passion and persistence and determination and patience as well the three p's um because you have to you have to keep working on it it's it's not it, if if you're really interested in getting into wildlife filming in particular it's it's pretty much a life commitment you're committing it's a lifestyle choice really because uh, you know we work very long hours you know there's the sort of you know, ridiculous hours and times in the day when you get sent to very remote locations of, of the planet and um it's you know very much team team effort as well so mm-hmm. if you're very keen to work in wildlife film definitely you know build up your portfolio connect with people that are similar to you um, but also you must have that passion, which I'm sure you do, Antonio, because it sounds like you, you've been asking brilliant questions. Um, but yes, for anyone who's keen and interested, yeah, definitely kind of read up on that topic. And of course, there are courses that you can get involved in as well. But again, you don't need those. Being in Bristol does help, but we've also been working with remote talent across the planet. So get onto wildlifefilm.org, uh, wild screen and connect with people and you know, just tell people what you're interested in. And, you know, that way you can start really getting your sort of feet on the ground with the industry. And uh, yeah, and by all means, please do get in touch with me for any questions at all. I'm always keen to help. Um, and finally, can you tell us where we can watch the mating game? Yes, <laughs> I'm so excited. I can talk about it. Finally. So it's on BBC One on Sunday, 8 p.m. The first episode is Grasslands and Plains. So I did work on that with an amazing team as well. And uh yeah, I, I hope you enjoy it. I'm very, we're all terribly excited to, to know what people think about it. And I certainly will be watching all of your comments on Twitter <laughs> when, it's, when it's trending. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be saving the best tweets just for my little personal, yeah, my little personal portfolio. But yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us today and for talking to us about your career and your filmmaking. Um, obviously, we're running talks all week for our Change the Image campaign, which um, this time around is celebrating females leading the way in the industry. So tomorrow we'll be talking to Gillian Edelston about her work in Johannesburg with Nelson Mandela. Uh, so you can register on the event site or you can uh, join us on YouTube. But thank you so much, Tanya. It's been a really wonderful talk and it's been really insightful to hear more about what you've been doing. Thank you so much, Stephanie. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you.